podcast starts now officially. This is wow. the official start of the podcast. Um, and I have to say, I feel great about it. Good. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, we were both going to start and we were both a, a little trepidatious about it and, you know, sort of an unnameable uh, sort of fear of starting. But well, we're diving in. Well, this primarily about different ways two people can be far, as far away from each other as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, think, you'd think the only two ways for two people to talk in this day and age are either on zoom or in person but you would be so wrong you i would not even know where to begin <laughs> it is so offensive to think that those are the only two ways to talk to a person because we are inventing such amazing new ways to be able to talk to a person who's really really far away i would say we are inventing different ways that almost all feel like things that would be in the movie her like it's all of them are like a different commentary on contemporary society and culture <laughs> It's like, oh, someone's looking at a screen, but their eyes are looking somewhere else. And someone is alone in a room that has like full camera equipment, but then it's not turned on. Everything is a short story by um, Ted Chang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really do feel... Um, I, we've been in the same room so much recently. Yeah. We've been recording, and now we're sort of returning to our roots of being uh, separate. Um, you know, we are, I think it's, you have to bring it up. We are a pandemic era. Our, the roots we of this were podcast are pandemic, pandemic era. era. I would say we got too cocky after lockdown measures lifted, and we said, oh, the pandemic is over. It's time for us to be in the same room. And then, Sure enough, that was not the case, despite what the CDC will tell you. And that's why now, because the pandemic is ranging on, we are back in different rooms. Yeah, actually. Um, so, yeah. Well, I have to say how, um, you know, I do feel jealous of your backdrop. Um, I know this right. is... And again, we've mentioned that I think actually this might be the first time the listeners are hearing about this because this episode is going to come out first. So we should go right out and say it. I am recording in a room that is overlooking sort of, I would say it's close enough to Times Square that it feels like Times Square. I'm on 46th Street and it looks like I am at like hosting New Year's Eve in Times Square. It looks like I'm hosting TRL. It looks like I'm going to look down and all my fans will be there <laughs> saying, when's the next episode of Straight Your Lap coming out? Yeah. I mean, literally, you. I need like a like an epilepsy warning before this episode because yes, there there's flashing, flashing behind me. <laughs> flashing billboard lights behind you and i i can't the, it's so jarring you've already pointed out but you were wearing such a tasteful sort of black ensemble of and um it is uh, like you need to like a flat brim hat or like some shiny sneaker or something because you in times square in sort of a a, a museum curator outfit yes. is you know what, quite you know what it's jarring like? i i feel like cuz you are right that i am for, even for my own standards, I'm wearing a very sort of serious looking outfit. I'm all, I'm all navy and black. And because I lost my glasses, I'm actually wearing my backup glasses, which are a thick black frame. Mm -hmm. Fresh. My hair is freshly cut. Okay. I'm wearing a watch. Yeah. And so I think what it looks like is if is if like a professor of sociology was trying to appeal to a wider audience and went on Joe Rogan <laughs> and went on like and went on like a shock jog podcast and is trying to maintain his dignity while while he is in the middle of Times Square being interviewed by Joe Rogan. And this is one that is genius and correct. Two, do you think okay, how yeah. possible is it as an individual to ever maintain dignity in an undignified space? Okay, first of all you're quoting me. <laughs> oh, wait, yes. Tell tell the tweet. Well, so earlier <laughs> earlier this week our I famous segment thought, tell the tweet. I know our famous segment tell the tweet. Uh, earlier this week I had the thought, you know, which I do think is actually a profound truth of our times, which is everyone thinks they're going to be the first person to maintain their dignity while posting online. Mhm. Mm like everyone thinks they're going to be the first person ever in history for whom that is the case. They're like, I see everyone else humiliating themselves. This is actually going to go, you know, uh, is related to our topic and we will bring our guests in a second. Everyone is, sees everyone else humiliating themselves and our hubris makes us think, but if I speak out publicly, if I clack, clack, clack on my keyboard and then hit post, it'll be different because it's coming from me and I have interiority, whereas all these people don't have interiority. Come to find out, everyone thinks they themselves have interiority. It's just that 
social media flattens that interiority. And so then you think everyone else doesn't have it, but you're the only one that does. I mean, I think this is genius. And I, I do want to almost expand it to, uh, you know, real life spaces as well. Yes, yeah, so you're saying you can, ha ha can you maintain your dignity while being in an undignified environment? Fine. So social media is one <laughs> such environment. I would say another one is like, um, for example, like, like I, one thing I've been, I, I consider myself alternative and even cool. Um, sure. And then I'm, I find myself in an office and mm -hmm. there's nothing more shameful than trying to hold on to any semblance of cool when you're inside yes. of an office. When you are in a corporate space and you are pretending to be cool, that is dark. And you it, it almost points out just how like sad and pathetic you are. Here's another <laughs> example. It, being in a fitting room, uh, trying on a pair of pants that don't fit, or even uh, if you're someone who wears suits, you know, uh, being like wearing something that clearly doesn't fit so that someone can touch you around your private areas and make it uh -huh. so that it fits better. I mean, is there a way for you to maintain a semblance of integrity in that moment and sort of be like, feel on a higher There's plane? no way. We are only products of our environment. There's we no can't way. fight it. <laughs> yeah. It's just the truth. I think that is very much the case with like when you have to, when some really respect, when like, they make Judith Butler do a video, do a TikTok or something. I actually recently saw a clip of Judith Butler sort of jokingly standing Beyonce. So it's Judith Butler being interviewed and some interviewer is like, um, so would you say that no one lays claim to a specific identity, blah, blah. And then Judith Butler is like, well, except Beyonce. And in that moment, <laughs> My soul <laughs> left my body. I said, how far we have fallen. Damn, that is tough. I'm, I, am I? No, I, I think really this is a perfect uh, I feel like place to is, do so. This is, I, I think this is sort of a perfect uh, conversation for her yeah. to weigh in on. So I, without further ado, she's joining the <laughs> Timers Club. <laughs> we'll, give her, we'll give her her little jacket afterwards and we'll do a sketch, a sketch about it where it's you and Paul Rudd. That's uh, yeah, please welcome. And and dare I say, you know, in the previous world, I might say, uh, you know, musician, podcaster, actress. Now I will say filmmaker, writer, director of the new film from Neon Pictures, Stress Positions, Theta Hamill. Hello, uh, you both. Hello to you both. George, Sam, it's a pleasure um, to be back. I, it's a pleasure to be doing this uh, hilarious two timers uh, sketch <laughs> with Paul Rudd. Yeah, he's on his way. <laughs> it's going to be Paul Rudd. Be great. Alec Baldwin is actually yeah, in yeah. Studio. Steve Martin's in the studio <laughs> tonight, um, so that's really exciting. That's huge. He's a fellow yeah, two timer. Yeah. Uh, he, well, he, I don't know. I uh, yeah, he's a I five timer. Five I'm getting timers, my jokes mixed up. Yeah. But Theta, you know, speaking of being able to maintain your dignity while being in an undignified space, you yeah. know, we are forcing you to do a video podcast. There's no way around it. Yes. <laughs> you are we you are someone who I do believe has dignity. And yet we have made you come to Midtown in order to film a videotaped comedy podcast hosted by two gay guys. Do you feel like you are able to maintain your dignity? <laughs> I think so. Okay. So far, yes. Uh-huh. That is because I was thinking when you guys were talking that it is context specific, that it's like a shoe and a foot or something, that there, that there are people, maybe podcasters, who by vocation are able to maintain their dignity yeah. while doing a podcast, as ridiculous as that sounds. Mm -hmm. There are also people who, like, for example, models, mm -hmm. yes, who can maintain their dignity in the most ridiculous situation as long as somebody is taking their photograph for a modeling job yeah. like they can stick their tongue out or bend <laughs> over or like play with the otters or they can they can hurl a whatever embarrassing thing they can uh -huh. be covered in mud yeah uh and because it's a fashion editorial and they are a fashion model they'll preserve their dignity but if you put them on a podcast i'm not saying this is necessarily the case like maybe they'll can hold Yes, I mean maintain it, but they might, certain, yes. they might fall apart. Yes, they might fall right no, in their face. That is that is a very good point. I mean, the model thing is such a great example because these women are put in the most humiliating situations, and not only do they maintain their dignity, they are elevated well, somehow. Like yes. you are then suddenly. No, like I mean, an this icon. is so genius. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like the job. The difficulty of being a model is maintaining dignity in undignified positions. It is like. 
Yeah. Well, that's and by the, the way, that is what qualification. It, yes. And also, by the way, that is the entire genius behind America's Next Top Model <laughs> is what if you took women who are not able to maintain their dignity in these situations yeah. and then put them in even worse situations than Bella Hadid <laughs> yes. is put in. It is the, that is what yes. that is the cruelty of it is being like if Bella Hadid was writhing around in a salad, she would somehow find a way to maintain her dignity. Yes. But you stupid bitch from Ohio, <laughs> you can't. Well, this is the pro that's the other thing is that the third, it's actually like if you ever watch if you ever have a second angle yes. on someone posing for the main camera, that is there's no dignity there, even for models, frankly. Yes. When you see them in a BTS like mm -hmm. doing this, like moving their face around like this and holding a position. Even the most beautiful of them, you go, <laughs> stupid, like that's the dumbest thing. And then you see the photo and you go, oh, fine. This, yeah. I'm stupid. Sure. I'm stupid because I was trying to make a mockery. <laughs> but it's but that second angle is like, yeah. uh, that second angle is always devastating. And that's the reality mm -hmm. show angle. Right. That's the, those, yes, that's no, those when, cameras. Of course. I mean, so then I guess it really leads to the question, like, is dignity innate or is it about knowing your <laughs> angles? It's about knowing your angles. It's about compatibility, Yeah, I think. It's really about compatibility. It's always being aware of context and where you fit into it. Uh, yes. And it's really hard. What were we talking about right before this? It wasn't, we weren't talking about, my God, uh, I, don't go back. Don't go back. Don't get, don't get lost in thought. There was another context where you were- The f fitting room. Don't the fitting room the fitting room yes. <laughs> no it wasn't the fitting room <laughs> I ruined it I just lost no 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 Sam Sam you uh, said something uh, oh an office space oh, office, an, office a corporate setting no damn it wasn't that I'm sorry we'll check no, the no, record no. later well there's social media we'll, is that it because we were talking about <laughs> no. no okay, okay. No, it was we're gonna so, we're gonna check the record so well, well, I um Fuck. I I'm sorry to you both I'm sorry to <laughs> no never apologize <laughs> for being yourself <laughs> never apologize <laughs> No, um, nobody. Did. I um, recently it's was eating food, uh, and models were sitting at the table next to me. And yeah, it, pretty happen. much every meal in Los Angeles, California, models end up sitting next to you at the the dinner table, yeah. and um, it yeah. was actually one of the most exciting things to hear their conversation because I've never heard like straight guy like a model who is a straight, straight male, male models, models being like oh man oh, I mean the wow. casting for the Bottega show this year was like fucking fire like seriously like I was so excited to be part of it and it was like to hear that tone with those words was so jarring to me and I was like but you're but you like Bottega yeah. Veneta like you're you're a gay guy and they're like no because I'm saying that it's fire <laughs> 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 totally the word saying, fire they um, no, they're active participants in gay culture. It's again, it's, you know, it's one of the strangest things. Do you, you feel do. like okay? So here's, I would say what Sam is describing, that is an angle where they're not. <laughs> Dignity, <laughs> lost. Dignity down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All that power she built up. Dignity down. Someone get her her dignity back. No, I have so much to say on this. But Go you on. know what, though? I just want to say sneezing, a perfect example of like, is there a way to maintain your dignity while sneezing? Literally, no. no. Not even if you if are. If you are Giselle you know, Bunchkin, Angelina you Jolie can maintain your dignity peak. while sneezing. If you're Giselle. You no, think so? I don't, I don't think, think so. so. I think it's probably <gasps> grotesque. And I think that also it gets really ridiculous when people try and daintify it. Yes. When you hear people give a really squeaky little demure little sneeze, like they seem way worse than somebody who like goes, ha! That, I, I actually you find know? it so no, really sad true. when someone does a little sneeze because it's like live out loud, like mm -hmm. believe in yourself, take up space, you know? Take up space. We you tell have our girls to, to be you small. have to go big. Yeah, exactly. Well, you have to go big. I, I used to be very embarrassed about my dad. You know, dads classically all sneeze as though it's like <laughs> they're in the Lion King or something, and it's like the big audition scene. Yeah. And yeah. I used to be so embarrassed of that, and I'm like, that is so much more dignified yeah. than being. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. I'm also like, do you yes. get the release if you do the little one? Like, I don't know if you yeah, get the release. Exactly. People are of the <laughs> Who will I be if I get released? I think they are. Uh, yeah, it is a scary uh, thought for yeah. a lot of people. But to yeah. go back to your male model thing, I do think what you're describing is exactly seeing them at the wrong angle because you are there as an observer, as a reality show observer, yeah. seeing them 
speak while eating lunch, they are not supposed to be I mean, to be also doing, seeing you know, like the half eaten yeah. food, like it fully ruins the fantasy. Yeah. Like it's sort of, you need almost the like Paris Hilton eating the burger, like where you have to like pretend you ate the whole thing at least so that it's not like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm like trying to be skinny. Like I need to feel like I just am this way. Well, this, I remember this, I mean, I've probably like used this anecdote to death, but I think not, I mean, to be vulgar, to be sexual about it, that there are people for whom sex, like any getting caught in a sex act yes. would not be undignified. Yes. There are certain faces like, you know, there's like a dick, there's like a cocksucker <laughs> face mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where if there's. <laughs> if they are caught on a like uh, blowing someone on camera, you it wouldn't be a scandal. You wouldn't go, oh, how outrageous, how embarrassing. Mm. And I do think that there's something also in that particular face that they can eat with dignity. I, this is I, if I, you can suck cock with dignity, you can eat with. Dignity. Yeah, if you have a sort of mouth face that <laughs> yeah. allows you to like put a full cock into your mouth totally. and like still be yourself, and everybody goes, "Oh yeah, that's Gary. That's just how he is." Right. Like you could probably eat a big full <laughs> fat Subway sandwich, like dripping down your front, yeah. and not lose anything in terms of dignity. You probably do. Just, you do either of you feel like that. that you no, can I, eat and or suck cock with dignity? Absolutely not. I have a small mouth. I have a weird face. It's I not going to work. I actually can suck cock with that. I believe, I believe that, that, too. I believe that. I you cannot. Your, you could probably eat. You could go to <laughs> Schnippers. I would say, so this is, wait, I'm actually really happy we're talking about this. <laughs> I think there are two kinds of people when it comes to sex. Yeah. One is the person for whom their sex personality is sort of a, you know, slight variation on their normal personality and extension exactly of their normal it, personality. Yes. And there are other people who disappear into sex. Yes. And I do think, and who knows, maybe this is because I'm not liberated enough or something. I am the former. I am yeah. like, I, of course, get into <laughs> get into it and enjoy it. It's yes, not like yes. I'm just, it's not yeah. like I'm, I yeah, you're, like I'm podcasting. You're not like, right, so right, is this cock means. gay or straight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I can, I'm recognized. If someone walked in yeah. on me and saw me having sex, they'd be like, that's sort of what I imagined. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. You wouldn't be caught out. Yes. Yeah. And I have in my life had sex with people that I've known socially and then had sex with where ah. I'm like, oh, you're the other kind. Yeah. You suddenly are literally being yeah. like a basically drag <laughs> character. Yeah. Sex drag <laughs> character. Yeah. Yeah, and I now have to almost meet this new person that I did not know when we were hanging out at Julia's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do, okay, and not to get too no, it's a real betrayal. Do you feel like you're the which of the two would you say you are? Oh my god, I don't know. Well, I think for me, back when I was, I was, I'm not very sexually active because I'm monogamous at the moment. Oh, and, you know, go what, off. It, it just means that just means like a smooch and rolling over and <laughs> going to sleep. But I would get a little bit more effeminate and mm -hmm. soft and gentle. Uh -huh. And I guess it's continuous with the person that I would like to be. Like if I don't yeah. sneeze and have my <laughs> headphones fall over my face, like I would like to be more demure in life and walk daintily around, but I could maintain that at most uh -huh. for the length of the That is so fascinating because you would think it would be the opposite where, you know, you're in a reliance. <laughs> sure. You know what I mean? Like no, that's like the I, sort yeah. of like um, conventional narrative is like, oh, someone is really quiet in person, but then a freak in the sheets. Right. But no. you're saying the opposite. It's like, it would be kind of, it would be because, because of the endorsement, almost like if you're like, uh, like the camera gives you permission as a model to throw yes, your hair around yes. and dive into the mud. If a man comes over thinking that he's going to um, be with a, a beautiful trans lady, mm -hmm. and that's what he is in the mood for. Mm -hmm. Then you you can full, fulfill that, and you don't feel like you're taking any liberties. You don't think like you don't feel like you're doing something wrong. Yeah. But if I were to walk around um, floating and talking in a in a floaty, delicate little voice, I would feel like I actually had lost mm. dignity at that point. Oh, I would feel like if I was ordering ordering at Starbucks and that huh. voice or something, I would feel. Mm -hmm. I'd feel silly. So I don't know if that I'm fully the second category. I'm not the category of the I see beast what you're saying. that comes I see what out. You're saying. Yeah. But I don't know if it's fully continuous. So maybe there is a third category that is going. It's the opposite di direction. Making, and I don't want to say, I was about to say making yourself smaller. That's not what it is because that would be in fact <laughs> phobic. <laughs> 
Oh, no, it is, but it is that, though. But, you know, it's making yourself, so, yeah. Lighter, smaller. Lighter, smaller. Lesser. Lesser, but not not in a shame-filled way, just because that is what the persona you want to embody. It's the one that it feels appropriate to the situation. Yeah. So, but I haven't, I haven't been in that role for a long hmm. time. Interesting. I'm definitely, um, I think, in the camp of losing yourself. I'm like, I feel like I'm like a little bit really? different. Um, That's exciting. Yeah, I block that my brows exciting. to get into the drag character of having sex. <laughs> is that out of, is that out of carnal, just carnal energy or is it out of a do you want to leave do you actively want to leave yourself I think it's I I do think it's a little bit more out of carnal energy and it's also about like like I'm sort of (laughs) I'm oh my god this is gonna be the most embarrassing thing I've ever said sex to me well it's a lot like improv (laughs) and you're (laughs) It, it's a lot it's a like lot it. Like it's it. not like it. And I oh, think I'm it. sort of like, okay, who am I going to be in this scene? Like, I like uh, the old, like I'm playing, yeah. a, like I'm listening and I'm like going to respond and sort of be whatever um, I'm going to agree until yeah. we, we find ourselves in a different position. Um, yeah, yeah. I sometimes, I sometimes <laughs> am almost <laughs> envious of people <laughs> who grew up with a lot of shame around sex. <laughs> no, then they got to feel the liberation yeah, of yeah. like, finally I'm myself. Yes. Whereas I, you know, my parents are by no means like hippies or anything like that. But like yeah. my mom talks to us pretty openly about sex. Like my <laughs> sisters will tell her about like yeah. guys or whatever. And I'm like, okay, so it's like, this is my impression of me in the middle of sex. Like, so my mom <laughs> would approve of this? <laughs> Yeah, I, and I had the opposite. My my family did not talk about sex ever, and so there you go. It's yeah, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to be bad. Like th- this is illegal. What I'm doing is illegal, wait. and it's not me doing it. Wait, I actually am so eager to get into the topic. So I'm like, let's literally do our first segment, get it out of the way, and then get into the topic. How do we feel about that? I think that's beautiful. Okay, Theta, our first segment is called Straight Shooters. And in this segment, we ask you a series of... You didn't have to prepare anything, don't Okay, okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) We ask you a series of rapid fire questions where you have to choose one thing or another thing to gauge your familiarity with and complicity in straight culture. Okay. The one rule is you can't ask any follow-up questions about how the game works. You just have to go with your gut. Okay. And you can't overthink it because overthinking is... The leading cause of death among intellectuals, <laughs> <laughs> among Manhattan-based intellectuals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So let me pull mine up. All right. Uh, okay, ready? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Dripping with contempt or quipping about Hannah Arendt? <laughs> Dripping with contempt. Okay, Theta. Camouflage or decolletage? Decolletage. Theta, hmm. building a brand that can cut through the noise or sinking into sand but doing it with poise? Hmm. Sinking into sand but doing it with poise. <laughs> okay. Chilaquiles or Mila Kunis? Oh, uh, <laughs> Chilaquiles. Okay. The rent was due or get bent. I do. <laughs> the rent was due. The rent, be- the rent was due. Okay. Mixing business with pleasure or mixing salt with pepper? Mixing salt with pepper. Wow, a classic combination if I've ever heard one. (laughs) Okay. Um, The Joker fully adieu or playing poker and entering that milieu? (laughs) I have to say playing poker and entering that milieu, no offense. Okay. Um, Suddenly the Koontz is me or suddenly I see this is what I want to be. Suddenly the Koontz is me. God, to be two gay guys that, without planning it, did two Lady Gaga themed <laughs> in a row. In a row. Ending up with the second one, you know, yeah. for my um, for my disparagement of the first one. Yeah, I would never ever not want to be two gay guys having two Lady Gaga references in a segment. Well, because I do, we can't get into Gaga because. It's true. It, it's too raw. It's too raw. <laughs> but I know that you are someone who thinks about. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, and I know it's like I know that I'm going to have to think more about her the closer we get yeah. to fol- fully add to. Whereas Kunst is me. Those are happy memories. Those are happy, those are happy memories. Then, yes. You know, you actually really have to pace yourself in terms of fully add to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I can't. There is a world in which I will enter such a deep depression if I think about it too hard now. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's too, actually too many. It's too much. I mean, it's, it's the way that a piece of media is like, 
okay, the next year is laid out for me. Like I know what I will be talking about, when I will be talking about it, how I will be talking about it. I'm it it's it right it, now. I'm feeling it, the mounting. Well, because, and you're feeling it because speaking of pieces of media, you know, you are actively promoting your directorial debut. That's a positions. nice, that's a nice segue. That's a nice segue. I'll draft <laughs> off a of folio I do. <laughs> and you know, fantastic energy. We weren't able to locate uh, a screener and we're, so we are both seeing it along with everyone else in New York and Los Angeles this week. But, and correct me if I'm wrong, from what I understand, it is about a young tennis player played by Zendaya. Yes. <laughs> it's about a love triangle. A love a triangle. classic uh-huh. formation. She gets injured playing yes. tennis. Brutally so. And you see <laughs> every almost. you see every bit of it. You see that bone through the knee. Yeah. yeah. And horrific. so you, you know, based this on your career as a tennis player. As a tennis player. pro. No, I bought, as a tennis coach, I based it on my career as a tennis coach. Uh, oh. Coaching, you know, young professionals. And I myself was was um, hot gay Josh O'Connor or whatever. <laughs> oh, see, I would have thought you were the Zendaya, but you were hot. You <laughs> no, know, I was hot gay Josh O'Connell, and I and I. This is earlier in my life. You know, oh, I, yeah, I no, that's true. I had some, some serious changes, but before I did that, boy, did I have a great time, and, and I who challenged your... a lot of stereotypes. Before <laughs> I got the name. You're one of the top people who challenged stereotypes. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. I'm, there's three of us, you know, mm-hmm, and all mm-hmm. of us. <laughs> yes, you, Josh O'Connor, mm-hmm. and Luca Guadagnino, <laughs> <laughs> and the other one, the twink one. And yeah, the twink one. With Those the, are the challengers. Imagine if you know you're the other twink. Okay. Yeah. Your entire life, you've been told, "God, what a beautiful twink you are." <laughs> You know, someday, someday you'll be, someday you'll be one of the twinks we this see on so TV. Funny. Okay, this someday, is so funny. Mike some, Fe- Feige, is no one like knows. Mike Feige. Imagine that is happening for you. Suddenly, you get the opportunity to be a twink on TV, suddenly and lo- suddenly the kunst is you. <laughs> lo and behold, you're sharing the screen with Zendaya, the number one yeah. actress of her generation, yes. and Josh O'Connor, the chosen twink of 2024. <laughs> but Josh O'Connor is not is twink. Chosen. Look, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> he's cho- he's, it's as if he were, sorry, it's as if he were the chosen twink, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Josh, little Josh has got like 5 billion gigs lined up. That's coming. true. That's true. He's, he's been chosen. All right. Did you see La Chimera? I did. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think? I thought it was beautiful. Yeah. I thought it was nice. I thought, you know, and it features... The chosen, the chosen, the chosen twink himself, looking <laughs> wonderful and all filthy. Yeah, down up and those speaking Italian tunes. the entire time. Yeah, yeah. Huh. I mean, <laughs> Sam, you seem like you have a. You didn't. What you didn't see, La Chimera, also from Neon. Uh, no. <laughs> in theaters now. <laughs> no. I like that the one movie we're not talking about is yours. <laughs> Well, I want to support the brand. I want to support the company. Of course, yes. We have La Chimera. Well, yeah, we have you know, Immaculate in theaters. Now. Oh, yes. Immaculate with the gorgeous and talented Sydney Sweeney, ladies Sydney, and gentlemen. Sydney Sweeney, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> woo! Should I would like to have been in some. You know, I think it's yeah. really smart yeah. to raise up neon. You know, a rising tide lifts all ships. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think that's... Do you... Um, well, we were talking about Josh O'Connor. Yeah, I was, I was trying to probe your, your well, discomfort. I, I, I do think... <laughs> I think, Sam, you did seem, A, very defensive when I called him a twink and and have been a bit quiet as we're getting into, you know, how he's the chosen one of 2024. It's not that I don't think he's the chosen one. I just don't know if he's the chosen twink. I think, you know, I think words matter. Um, I think... (laughs) Well, of course, especially going into an election year. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I think, you know, we can't just... uh, uh, Talk about a straight thing is just to call anybody a twink. Who? No, uh, you're right. That's a good point. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. And I'm like... Okay, but we aren't just calling him a twink. We're calling him the the chosen, the chosen twink. twink which but is the like, chosen twink has to be a twink. Like I think he can be the chosen. No, I don't think so. <laughs> That's like you know. Speaking of chosen twinks, like like is um, Paul Atreides mm-hmm. a from a fremen? Okay, no. <laughs> He's just, he was chosen. That's yeah, the that's point. Good, the that's literally the chosen. point. So he you, a twink and then he you was guys yeah. are both being, um, uh, the. I'm being Zendaya in Dune 2, and I'm sort of being like, no, I don't, <laughs> yeah. uh, he's not my chosen twink. Yeah. Um, and you are being and we're um, like, the believers. Line, bitch. We're yeah. being like Javier Bardem. Javier Bardem, guys, that's it. Get in line. Yeah, fall, fall in behind Josh O'Connor. <laughs> The chosen twink. He's like he's juicy and great and handsome. He's what we need. Okay, it's gravitas. 
big dirty hands in that fucking movie digging through those tombs. Yeah, digging you're gonna through those love tombs. it. <laughs> he's got he's got it all up and down that suit. Okay, that white suit. I mean, I he, can't wait to see now. it. I do find him Curtis extremely Liam. hot. He's um, really hot. Okay, and your your hesitation, Sam, is that he's. Is it that he's too tall? Because I do think he has a twink. He has a twink. Uh, I can't you believe know, I'm being phenotype. grilled. I think, you know, I think I'm being so bullied right now. And I think um, once the listeners. You think Mike Figus is the chosen twink? You think the other challenger is the chosen twink? Yeah. No Mike Figus? No one even knows who that is, Sam. <laughs> I think he's more twinky. I think if we're being honest, I think he's more twinky. Well, I guess wow. so. I mean, that's true. I mean, that's true. But I don't see how it has any bearing on this discussion. <laughs> I think anyway. I just think he's like um, Josh O'Connor is like too beefy. Wow! I oh guess. my god. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> we've hit a wall here. We're not going to come together on Look, this. Look, I <laughs> we're the, we're on the East Coast. You're on the West yeah. Coast. Yeah, maybe Josh um, O'Connor is just too East Coast for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And the other it's one like is West pizza. Coast. It's LA like has a pizza. It's pizza. Yeah. It's cigarettes, all black. It's oh Carrie my. Bradshaw. Yeah. It's the West Village. Mm-hmm. It's Julius. Yeah. <gasps> yes. God Keith damn. Herring. You know, I put in my <laughs> fucking time and the you're stripping Keith me Keith of the my legendary New York Keith <laughs> Herring. Have you heard of Basquiat? God, those were the days. <laughs> those were the days. You could get a you could get a loft for a nickel. Sure, it would have roaches. A loft for a nickel and then a blowjob in the corner yeah, from yeah. Amanda Lapore. <laughs> We were all fucking and sucking we were back all then. Fucking and sucking back then. And Josh O'Connor takes us back to those days. Yeah. Pre Giuliani, <laughs> Philip Glass, <laughs> you know Robert Wilson, yeah. Basquiat. Oh, yeah, Basquiat. Well, I'll 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 reflect <laughs> on this and I'll try yeah. to understand where you're coming from. Um, you know whether or not he's a twink. It is exciting to have a new guy. It's a nice. It's nice to have a new guy. I feel that he is like he is like our Adam Driver. Mm. If Adam Driver play was set to play basically like five gay roles in a row. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, which is what I wanted from Adam Driver and probably will never get. Yeah. Has he ever played gay? Adam Driver? Yeah. I actually don't know. I'm not, but I don't, I somehow, oh, you know what? I saw him speaking of Times Square uh, Angels in, America. in Angels in America. He was playing gay then. The Mormon. He, oh. Yeah, gay and Mormon. That's, and he, a, that's a great role for him. Did it, was he? Oh, like, no, he was Lewis. No, he was oh. He was Lewis. Uh-oh. He was Tony Kushner. Can you believe it? Adam Driver. Was he good? Yes, he was good. He was extremely attractive. This was, before, I think, before he became like a huge, huge star. Anyway, speaking of attractive men, you know. <laughs> well, you know what's, I just want to say in terms of Adam Driver, like yeah. they, anyone up and down, you know, Sunset Boulevard has to play a gay role for some Netflix rom-com. And the one person as you're saying, which is so genius, that would be such a fun person to see in a gay role. Oh, yes. Doesn't do it. Doesn't do it. Adam Driver should be in like a Oscar movie playing a gay guy. They believe me, I bet Luca Guadagnino every day is like <laughs> saying, uh, did he call He's back? violently did he jerking call back? it. <laughs> yeah. <Being> like, <laughs> He's ready to stand outside yeah. that door and it doesn't have, the movie never has to get made. He's yeah. just saying, Adam, please, please, I need a new sofa. <laughs> I mean, I need, a new, <laughs> I need to redo my patio. Can you please just sign on to a development deal yeah. to play a gay role for me? I'm Luca. While we're talking about just generally handsome actors, mm. I'm like, yeah. Paul Mezcal also constantly is like has like 14 gay roles in the works. Not um, the chosen twink. Not the chosen twink. <laughs> Well, I but think I, we can all, yes, go on. But go I'm on. just sort of like, conf- I'm sort of like, okay, wait, what are you trying to, are you, is this like, are you gay? Like, bro, are you gay? Like, <laughs> <laughs> gay bro bro, bro. <laughs> bro you're bro. playing gay so much i'm like are you gay like i actually feel like he's trying to tell us he's gay i think mm. it was a fucking huge mistake for him to do all this gay shit you think so oh yeah paul Mescal. i think, I think his star has never mistake. been bright really you do kind of to me like when i to me there's something like corny and squeamish about like going like yeah i really got into it no holds barred in terms of kissing and sex with male <laughs> totally co-star. totally i mean listen i agree that it's corny i yeah. guess my you know you have to in order to be a star you have to reach the right level of corniness yeah, where you can be true. both accepted by the a24 crowd yeah. and accepted by the netflix crowd and i think he is at that yes. perfect nexus right now don't get me wrong yeah you know 
poke him with one pinky and he might fall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying he's yeah. there reigning forever. He has to be careful. But I do think he is in that sweet spot that Timmy was after, like, Call Me By Your Name or after Lady Mascal. Mascal. Wow. Okay. M- maybe not as big, but you know what I mean? Like half indie, half mainstream. No, that's true. That's true. That's true. And actually where Adam Driver was sort of right after Girls, where he had like done yes. Girls, but also done Star Wars or whatever. The thing, the thing is, you never know with... <laughs> Preach it, sister. <laughs> <laughs> you never, you never know who's gonna listen and get mad at you. Children will listen. <laughs> so children will listen. So to me, I'll say that I wish the best for yes. Paul Mescal. That said, I want to offer my condolences for him because he's not the chosen twink. The chosen twink is Josh O'Connor. <laughs> it's, Josh. it's already been decided. It's been decided. The clock has been set for the next presidential term. That's mm-hmm. the Josh O'Connor term. <laughs> had, you know, Chalamet was the chosen twink for the past couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Now he's, I don't know if he's the chosen twink. You know, to me, it's like, it's tough. he's actually too big. He's actually too big. I agree. I actually think Timmy is Timmy, so Timmy, big Timmy. that he is surpassing just what the volume that his tiny body can handle. I agree. And the only way further is for him to like literally get buff. Yeah. He's done as much as he can yeah. as a little twin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, true. <laughs> it's like, uh, and we can't just see him get tossed around. He has to like, uh, he has to, he has to put on. He has to fucking man up. He has to bulk up. <laughs> he has to go to Schnippers. He has to shove a burger in his mouth. It would look fine. <laughs> wow. Um, I uh, So we really are doing an amazing job of not promoting Theta's film. Oh, yes. Theta's film. <laughs> We, I think, oh. like maybe a better job than anyone uh, of not promoting Theta's film. Um, I'm like Theta. Do you feel um, when someone avoids promoting your movie, are you like, are you like this is good because I can uh, continue to joke and laugh, or are you like this is bad because I need to promote this movie? No, I <laughs> don't promote the movie. I mean, I'm happy to. I I I feel like it's enough to go movie mm-hmm. Theta Hound whatever. And then talk about other things. I can talk about the movie. The movie is uh, the movie is great. It's the one of the it's the greatest movie ever made by anybody. Greatest movie ever made. Greatest movie ever made. So certainly greatest movie ever made, starring three past Stradio Lab guests. And I think we can. Who's the third? Oh wait, that's not true because sorry, maybe it is true, but I just mean there are other examples. I would say the two movies that star three Stradio Lab guests are Fire Island and your film. Ah, you, John and Amy Zimmer. Ah, amazing. Yes. Yes, and we play, we make up, I don't know what you want to make of this, the rotten millennial core of the movie. Yes. Oh, the three of you. The three of us. So okay. the the three characters, there's three uh, rot, sort of, I don't want to say rotten, you know, they're fallible, um, uh, but it's not totally abject. And then they're um, uh, sort of all engaging with members of the younger generation, and then there Got are some it. members of the older generation. So it's all about this sort of generational antagonism a little bit, which is very topical, very hot right well, now. Well, can I tell you something? Because I actually noticed this, like, again, we have not seen the film, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, we know a lot about it. Yeah. And I think, I think you are someone, and maybe I'm projecting, but I think you are someone who either tackles everything head on or wants to exist outside of the discourse altogether. Uh, yeah. And I think with this movie, y- you took everything, like generational discourse, yeah. COVID hypocrisies, um, sort of like doing a recent period piece, which I think is very on trend. Like you really went all in on all of it. Like you were like, this is a no matter what, a conversation piece. Was that intentional? Well, I, it's like I kind of did both. I kind of did both things, maybe in a cowardly way. Like the movie does the the. There was a version of the movie that was like really early draft that was so tasteful, mm-hmm. and like I do a, a shit and piss podcast, yes. like, and that's like par- at least half of what I am po- capable of doing. And it's not that I went in and did a shit and piss draft. I was just like, this is too aloof. Like, so I'll steer it a little bit more toward the um, uh, the bullseye a little bit. Yeah. But the the movie is is o- oblique in the way that it handles a lot of stuff that is ambient in the discourse. So there is stuff about ethnicity, identity. There is uh, stuff about generational antagonism. There's obviously stuff about COVID and, mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and pandemic stuff. Uh, but like the... Uh, I really don't think that the movie makes a meal of it the way that like a fucking 
uh, contemporary, not to disparage this because I, it's I, it's like a little bit of a cliche and maybe nobody is doing this anymore, but a contemporary play would do where like yes. you you, tr- you take a topic from the headlines, you have like a professor say something untoward and they're off the cuff remarks to a student. And then the play ends with somebody having strangled somebody else, heaving, covered in water, you know, <laughs> panting, and then the curtain drops down there and they go, ah! Do you know what I'm saying? I've seen four plays like that this calendar year. <laughs> really? Yeah. Because it is like, okay, I do think that that um, that the, my goal with the movie, and I'm being oblique now, but my goal with the movie is to, to actually shrink all of this explosive discourse mm-hmm down into something a little bit smaller and gentler in order to actually be able to look at it without the the raging torrent of like of twitter of twitter yes and and things like that so and the present moment it's interesting it's the difference between like an allegory and a oh god not metonym or uh i guess it's the difference between going big and going small and actually this is something i was thinking about the other day is like Are small questions bigger than big questions? (laughs) That's a this is such a a classic George thought. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's very it's hard to come down one way or the other. Like, is actually when you think about like what's the biggest question? Like, what is the meaning of life? Yeah, is that actually the dumbest question? What, Sam? Uh, no, I have to say, I'm addicted to when you do this. I, I think it's like, <laughs> one, I think it is like, we. it's always smart and it's always funny, but it's also like, sometimes like if someone were doing a parody of us, it would be like, is something so hot? <laughs> it's actually frozen. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, of of, of course. <laughs> And and yeah, I'm aware of I'm 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 doing a parody of myself. No, I think it, I love it. Right. I'm addicted to it. I've, but but you oh, know yeah. what I mean? Like it, the biggest question: What is the meaning of life? What is the whatever? Is that actually the dumbest, most cowardly question you can ask? And actually, the biggest question you can ask is like, "What's for lunch?" Well, the, this is like I I do think that there is a um uh the the question of greatness yes. and scale is one that I have an opinion on, that, which is just like that, that there is a gra- there is an attempt to make, for in making a movie, for example, like to pick an important topic and maybe an important person related to mm-hmm. that topic and then to make an important movie. So you have, um, let's say, nuclear annihilation. Yes. And then you have uh, Oppenheimer and you go, I'm going to... St- I'm going to talk about Oppenheimer. I'm not going to talk about some guy that was involved in building the machine. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to talk about the douchebag that dropped uh, dropped them from the plane. Like, uh, I'm not going to talk about any of these small things. I'm going to make a big, immense movie about a big, immense person, about a big, immense, important topic. And I do think that the topic gets drowned in that scale a little bit. So you actually are losing some of the insight into what it actually is. Maybe the the actual extent of the horror of it you're losing. You know what it is maybe is that you are trying to capture the entirety of it and in doing so, you're making it smaller because you're making it fit into a box. Whereas if you do a small story about a family grappling with the anxiety of impending nuclear doom, it remains this big thing that is unreachable. Yes, and this even happens with framing. That that if you have a, if you, if you're walking, if you're walking in the subway and you're like, how can I get the full scale of this environment on screen? You pick a a wide lens Mm -hmm. and it compresses everything and you see the whole subway, but it feels small because it's been squeezed squeezed into the frame. Whereas if there's more outside of the frame, everything feels bigger. So I don't know. The relationship of big and small is, uh, is, is exciting. exciting (laughs) Um, You know who I, um, I'm like a a small of a big thing that works well that I like is um, I'm going to say it Cloverfield where it's like the big monster but you're only (laughs) seeing it through these like people that are like we're at a party oh no because like when there's a big monster thing it's like I'm seeing it through the government's eyes and it's like we have to take this thing down I'm like well that's kind of boring actually yeah you don't feel scared by it I don't feel scared well it's an act you see a giant Godzilla that's a toy I've seen that at FAO Schwartz (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's this big. <laughs> and it's made of chocolate and I ate it. It's made of chocolate and I ate it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's a very fruitful question. Oh, interesting. Uh, no, that's an amazing. I also, here. you both of you in all black um, discussing this. <laughs> I, I was really like, I'm at a talk back. I'm at a QA. and um, a This is so um, MoMA coded. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> um, should we get into our topic? Yes, that's a great idea. Theta, I would love for you to sort of like take it away and just tell us like what the topic is and what is straight about it, and then we can go from there. Okay, so this is a little bit of a loose one, so I thought like I think maybe we can develop it a little bit. Yes, but it's with regarding straight men, the difference between shame and embarrassment specifically that they never feel embarrassed mm-hmm. but they quite often feel ashamed yes and and the one example that i can think of is that um i'm trying uh after a long absence to go back to the gym and i feel so embarrassed at the gym yes. i think that being at the gym is totally embarrassing i think lifting weights is embarrassing i think the whole thing is really mm-hmm. embarrassing the outfits are embarrassing yes. um i don't think that straight men are embarrassed to be at the gym i don't think they're embarrassed to be grunting and lifting weights and heaving things. I think they feel shame that they aren't stronger. Mm. I feel they, they feel, sh- you know, in a way that I don't, I don't feel ashamed to not be strong. I don't feel ashamed to be uh, not good at lifting weights or working out. I'm embarrassed, feel embarrassed to be at a gym. Yes. Uh, well, that's, well, I'm just spitballing here. First thought. Okay. Mm-hmm. First thought is embarrassment more corporeal and shame is more internal. Yes. Like you are so aware of your body and that's what makes you embarrassed. Yes, embarrassment is like right in the face. It's like you feel you're blushing, you get embarrassed, you don't know what to do with your hands, that kind of thing. And it's like a guy, even just like a guy, the, the sounds men, make like at the urinal just like you're you're in the bathroom yeah. trying to be a normal person and someone next to you is being like oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah with yes Unre- unremorse with no remorse yeah the uh uh i don't know if i don't know for example if straight guys feel embarrassed when their jokes fail mm. i don't know if they feel embarrassed like when they flop at a dinner party like over di- like at a dinner party conversation what I, do you think i almost think that there's like they don't put the pressure on themselves to succeed at that like yeah. <laughs> like yeah, that's this bag thing i i think like at a dinner party like i do think um i was I mentioned this before but like the a straight person feels embarrassed at like the idea of public performance like they like putting on a show is embarrassing yeah. yes. but like it just moving there's something almost like uh back to your small versus big question about this where like gay people feel embarrassed in the small and and comfortable and not embarrassed in the big like uh, like wow. and i feel like straight people are the opposite where okay th- this is actually genius because i think this is also Okay, this is also why gay people feel more <laughs> comfortable like projecting sort of like having an influencer persona of some yes. sort. Yes. Whereas straight men, you know, for all their flaws are not trying to gain a following. Like I I understand there are counterexamples and there are like, you know, there's Je- Jeff Bezos and 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 you know, people are trying to go viral on LinkedIn or something. But sure. like in general, <laughs> sure. the stereotype of like you meet your girlfriend's boyfriend, the stereotype is like he has a private Instagram that he never posts on. Right? Yeah. He yeah. has he is not interested in that. He thinks it's for chicks. Yeah. You know, and so there's no there's less comfort with like sort of a public projection of self. And maybe that arises from a deep actually security in who he is. Like he doesn't feel the need to project. <laughs> he's not trying else. to get ahead of the story. Whereas- he's not trying to get ahead of the story because <laughs> yeah. it never even occurred to him that he would look bad in the story when it's published. That's true. I think getting ahead of the story is the key there. I think like thinking of things in terms of the story is a very <laughs> yes, gay yes, thing. Yes, yes. I think yes, like, truly what like, is the narrative? Yeah, what is the narrative? How am I being seen? How can I make this work? And I think that, that it's I mean it, it's genius because it's like okay, who writes the official historical narrative, you know, the hegemon, you know, the uh the people in charge, okay? Yeah, the, yes. the people who win write history. So sort of goes to show if you are in the privileged class, you're yeah. not worrying about what the story will ultimately look like because you know you will come out as a protagonist. It'll Whereas be flattering. It'll be flattering yeah. without you having to do anything. Yes. Whereas if you are in any sort of marginalized class, it, it it's on you to be self-publishing a zine. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Otherwise, yes. you'll be lost to history. Yeah, you'll be lost. You'll just be wiped. You'll or be even wiped. worse, you'll be the villain. Yes. I'm okay. Yeah. There's also something. Uh, hear me out. I, this is. I'm trying this. Where it's like, um, like. <laughs> okay. Like. <laughs> this is hard. Gay people. It. Gay people are like, okay, I've already, like, I've committed the ultimate shame. I'm like, I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm doing anal. Uh, I'm doing anal. I'm being shameful. I'm being embarrassing. I, like, and so it's almost like, okay, well, now I can pursue, like, I can sort of do whatever I want at all times. Like, we've yes. talked about that element. And then I feel like straight people still have a sense of, like, well, this will disrespect my family if mm -hmm. I'm, like, trying to be an influencer on the internet. Like if I'm like putting myself out, if I'm on stage wearing a silly costume, like what will that say about my mother and father? And uh, <laughs> I see that is perfect. I mean, it's literally the yeah. thesis of the concept of pride is like we have let go of shame and now right. there's no going back. Yes, yeah, so, because maybe it is like there's an early, the, the, there is an early experience. I do think that being in the closet, you feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. I do think that there is an early shame experience. And then yeah. there is this like releasing, there is a sort of Oppenheimer style <laughs> explosion of that. <laughs> and you, you, you say, I leave shame behind, at least as far as this is concerned. Yes. Like I will not be caught out being... G A Y. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I w and if that if, if pride is the word for that, then that's the word to use. Like the, I don't know. You can the 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 thing that I th that I think about is in incels and how mm -hmm. I don't really think that there are gay incels. Are there gay incels? I'm not tracking the issue. I think <laughs> there are. Mm. <laughs> I've, I think there are gay people who have the sensibility of an incel, yeah. but I don't think they find community with, incel, with other incels. Oh, that's a great distinction. Like, really? I think gay incels are basically like sort of online trolls that are being oh. like so cruel. Oh, ever. okay. You so, but I mean? they're they're like gay troll. But do you, they? But they could but they fuck if they want. They have yeah, sex. That's a good. That's a good point. They're not cell. That's true. <laughs> and in fact, I think people that are in cells yeah. do not have the violent... Like, I think gay incels yeah. are much more withdrawn and it, it, not motivated by revenge. Yeah, yeah, because I do think that this is like, okay, if I was, if I was like, you know, like going out and trying to be gay and like and like tried to make it work um uh, or go home with somebody and it would, didn't work out i would be embarrassed yes. i think i would be embarrassed and like again i maybe i'm too, being too um uh annoying about this distinction but no i i think, I think that yeah. incels yeah. feel ashamed Shame rather that than they even have to court women yes yeah okay like uh, it's not like, oh, it's embarrassing to like try and flirt with a woman. Like, I don't know what to say. It's like, I think they feel a deep, deep shame that is like, this is not supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're gay and you have an embarrassing experience, like that is supposed to happen. You signed up for that. Like, you know, when the minute you come out or whatever, you know that you're basically cursed <laughs> to a life of abjection and you're sort of <laughs> cool with it. Yes. And that's why that's what that's gay fun. That's how gay people have fun. By going, yeah, I'm cool with it. It's embarrassing, mm -hmm. but what are you going to do? I don't know. <laughs> well, there is a sort of, I mean, not to be truly like <laughs> baby's first cultural critique, <laughs> but like you could also connect that to like camp. Like sure, it's like sure. literally like celebrating the embarrassing. Yes. Like, yeah. You know, like. I think so. Wow. I think so. And what do you think, Sam? <laughs> I think it's genius. Um, I think, we, you know, I think the Stress fact positions. that we were able to bring it to April camp 19th. <laughs> is, uh, is just a show that we are, in fact, uh, an LGBTQ plus podcast. Um, yeah. You have to fucking hear. Sorry. What, no, the, keep going, it, please. I have never in my life. I mean, I've commented on this a little bit, like, because I, we the movie went to Sundance and we were mm -hmm. doing a junket and somebody went, we really think you're, uh, it's like, they said something about the movie being queer. Mm. And I was like, I did not think one time about it being a queer movie because there's no straight people in the movie. There's no straight character. It did not occur to me to put straight characters in the movie. And I didn't at all think that that would create 
a type of movie called a queer movie. But as the movie rolls out now and the marketing is coming out or whatever, and we're seeing like who the audience, the demographic is being targeted, you go, oh, it's a gay movie. Yeah. I didn't know that I was making a gay movie or a queer LGBT yeah, movie. you're making Eating Out 4. I thought I was making a movie. <laughs> I thought I was making a movie, but you, uh, we actually are just in this very abject little bubble. It really is. Um, sitting above Times Square. Yeah. I mean, Sorry, anyway, the that's bubble... My ba- that's my baby's first... Um, 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 inclusion. No, it's true though. I keep thinking about this in terms of like putting a queer movie out into the public mm-hmm. and asking the public to like come to the movie. And like the the in terms of knowing like the narrative, like trying to craft the narrative or get ahead of it. Yes. That that um, the the big example that I always think of is like Drag Race, which like half of queer culture was allowed on stage. The main Mm -hmm. stage, even though it's still a niche stage of like moms and their daughters watching it after school, okay? But there is no drag queen on earth who would even bat an eyelid at like a wa of their roommate getting fisted. (laughs) <laughs> like, do you know what I'm saying? That, like, yes, like actually, yes. the, there's this whole half that hasn't been brought on stage, yes, hasn't yes. been brought onto the main stage by Obama and, and uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. Is like the, the the fact that like I wouldn't even blink, <laughs> like I wouldn't even blink at that. Yeah, and, and neither the, would anybody that I and know. And the moms have no idea. That'll never come on stage. It'll never come on stage. It'll always be something over here. And like, I, I, you know what I'm saying? I think it's one of the most interesting things is that like collectively as a, as a, as a gay community, we like yeah. don't publicize that side. Like it is like, it's like, yeah, we're this. And then it's like, but also, yeah, we're like fully having sex inside of bars. But and this, it's like, is the, the, this is the challenge <laughs> with like, with this kind of visibility yeah. is that, you actually lose yourself in trying to untangle the logical inconsistencies. Yeah. It's like when people, it's like with something like drag queen um, story time hour, or whatever, yeah, oh, yeah. story hour. Yeah. It's so difficult to make the point both that drag queens are like this child friendly, yes. essentially like Disney cartoon character and yes. it's so fun for kids to see bright colors and someone in a costume and also that drag, and then in the same breath be like, drag is a radical queer art form that is anti-capitalist yes. and like <laughs> sex and kink positive. Yes, Like you just can't untangle those. And if you are sort of stupid and can hold two ideas in your head at the same time, I see how someone could then be like, oh, so they're grooming. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so they're going to they're going to be fisting at the library. <laughs> they're going to be fisting at the library. No, they're not going to be fisting at the library. It's like being bilingual. It's like yeah. if somebody is bilingual, they speak one language when they're talking yes. to those people and another here. And that's just what it means to be bilingual. I mean, so drag queens are I bilingual say, and the bilingual is reading kids' stories and fa- fisting. <laughs> <laughs> it's not exactly that. Really, but it is, it's not totally different. I mean, dare I say, it goes back to our conversation about dignity and context. Yeah. What, what angle are you filming the drag queen from? Because from one angle, yes. she's fisting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From the other angle, she's yes. reading Amelia Bedelia. Yes, exactly. And uh, but that's the, that's, uh, and actually, know. that is, it's like, how do they maintain dignity in those different um, contexts is one of the big challenges of being a high profile drag queen in the year 2024. It's crazy because, yeah, because they're signing autographs for children. Yes. And then, and then God knows what they're getting up to. That's like, you know, God knows. I mean, we, it's not God knows. It's like, <laughs> God okay, knows. they're just doing gay guy stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, okay. Yeah, just doing gay guy stuff. But I actually think weirdly, like apart from the like right wing people who are who are outraged by mm-hmm. it and trying to create a fury, that it's not even even if those drag queens like post on Twitter, there are drag queens who like have porn. They've have done pornos yeah. and they've started OnlyFans and stuff. And like it just gets absorbed in the blob. Like the algorithm sorts it aside and, and the drag keeps going and the fisting stuff or whatever. I know. <laughs> stays over well, here. It's, they turn, they just don't want to see. It. <laughs> wow. I mean, I could have was never this expected it. Was this funny? Did we? This was an absolute dream. Okay. I had, no, this was amazing. I, I feel like 
I, I have so much more I want to say, but I feel like I've just been like going off. Well, no, I just want to I, I want to say that it's very nice, actually, to be doing this because we I when we recorded first time episode two, I think of that of it, that it was, incarnation. Of that yes, yes, yes. Uh, that was we were about to start shooting the movie. And now the movie is all done. Wow. So it's a nice little envelope wow. around this period of my life at that on your podcast i ruined my reputation by saying i didn't like renaissance volume one um <laughs> then i came around to renaissance i will repeat my earlier sin by saying i am no huge fan of this <laughs> latest of volume two but i'm sure by the oh, wow. time we record yeah. again i will have realized that it's actually <laughs> genius and that she's actually ahead of all of us and that it's it's a really great, great uh, yeah i do remember that era very, first of all i just want to say we're very very proud of you and we're so excited Thank yeah i can't film. wait to see the movie you are one of the great minds and it is an honor to be to have you on our podcast twice truly club two times club <laughs> um but it was funny that era we had truly not we did not plan this, but somehow there were like three white people in a row that came on the podcast <laughs> and said they didn't like Renaissance and there was just nothing we could do about it. And we were like, well, that's what we're putting out into the world is a series of three, like three sort of like opinionated white people. <laughs> All disparaging it was John was also one of them. John yeah, was one yeah, of them. Yeah. And by the way, I, I think we all had a very similar trajectory because I also at first was sort of like, to be inundated with all the commentary on it, you lose yeah. sight of the matter at hand. Yeah. And now I've said this so many times, I love it. I like listen yeah. to it yeah. often. It, it brings me so much joy. I think it's maybe the best thing she's ever done. Yeah, like I yeah, really, yeah. I genuinely believe that. But um, it's wonderful that we have that on record forever. <laughs> forever. <laughs> we can I, correct it anytime. It won't matter. They'll turn and, the same blind eye. Yeah. I want the official record of this podcast to show that I actually am very much enjoying Cowboy Carter. And I thought, Good and move. I'm not just trying to appease um, mm. the rabid sure. Oh, fans. Sure. Um, I really went in skeptical and I listened once. I listened as hard as I could and I said, I don't know if I'm liking this. And then I put it on sort of in the background, sort of listening a little bit less hard. And I was like, oh, I'm actually really loving this. And now it's at a point where I put it on and I'm all in. That's um, great. That's wonderful. I love that. It's nice to like <laughs> not be like, sometimes it's so comforting to be like, oh, I'm one of the masses. Like, oh, oh I totally. don't have to, like, make oh, a stink a very, every time this comes up. That's a very widely discussed phenomenon. <laughs> 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 yielding, yielding to that feeling, but it is a sweet, sweet feeling. And I'm sure I, it will be an amazing tour mm -hmm. with a full bluegrass band. <laughs> yeah, just a washboard. <laughs> a bunch of horses coming out. Ooh, a lot of horses. I um, do want to say, George, uh, really quickly, I want to apologize. You know, a lot of these uh, L.A. recordings, it's been two uh, people in L.A. and just one George. You're getting a taste <laughs> of your own medicine. This is our first time where I am with the guest in the room and uh, you're away. Do you not see how it w has been for me? It's hard. George, this is so hurtful. <laughs> I can't believe you lived through this and didn't complain every single time. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it, there's something where everything I say, there's like a slight delay where I'm yeah. like, oh, I'm bombing. Yeah. Oh, they, and I'm bombing and they actually are mad at me. They like hate me. <laughs> and I'm like, play, like, I have to say this out loud because I was like, Theta's going to leave this recording and be like, wow, George is great. Sam is actually really quite stupid. Absolutely <laughs> not. Absolutely <laughs> not. You're <laughs> Right. I know the position. It's a terrible position. To be in. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, George, you are braver than the Marines. No, no, no. I think we are both two of the great gay men. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I yeah. Okay. We're gonna put a pin in some of these because I'm like I need to go at some point later. You know, maybe when I see Theta later this week, I need to go back to small versus big. I need to go back to. Um, shame versus embarrassment i need to go back to different personalities while uh, having sex and what how dignity and oh, yeah. you know i really think this is going to be an episode that gets lips a flapping <laughs> i i <laughs> to say the least seeing, i am seeing emails coming our way I am seeing DMs. I am seeing tags on multiple social media platforms. Okay, wait, okay, wait. Oh, I maybe have one more thing to say. Okay, what? I just think you can't. I think the issue is you can't escape 
shame no matter what. So like when we come out of the closet, we're like, okay, we're escaping our shame, mm -hmm. but we're just trading it for a million little embarrassments. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, that's, uh, very, that's actually very well said. That's beautiful. And, and so it's like e either way, it's just like, how do you want to release? How do you want to suffer? Yeah. Do you want it in small doses or in a deep, deep way? <laughs> that's wow, all. That's actually really, that's, that's exactly it because it really is like coming out is this weight lifted off your shoulders or you're oh, yeah. like, I don't have to keep this huge secret anymore. Yeah. But here I go ordering at the coffee shop and someone's giving me a dirty look. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Small. Wow. Well, yeah. But I'll pick small. Over yeah. So coming out is um, you're you're using Klarna to deal with your shame in <laughs> in installments. <laughs> is when you pay in installments. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Coming out is signing up for Klarna. <laughs> You're saying I'm not. I don't have the money to pay all this shame right now. Yeah, but I will but I'm pay gonna, it monthly. I'm gonna pay monthly. Monthly installments of four dollars <laughs> until this uh, fifty dollar top is paid off. Yeah, so, and honey, there will be interest. <laughs> <laughs> it's really called sorry, Klarna. It's a, <laughs> Klarna. Yeah. That sounds like a fake fantasy fiction. Name. I only heard about it this year actually because I, I had. I can't get into it, but I bought <laughs> I bought something that is the most expensive thing I've ever bought. And I was like, I don't have the money in my account for this. And it was like, do you want to pay an installment? So I was like, yeah. <laughs> you better believe I do. <laughs> oh, amazing. Yeah. I, I only know about Klarna because apparently teens were like getting in like to debt by just like, because they'd be like, oh, I can just yeah. pay an installment. I can just buy Bottega. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, wow. So shout out to Klarna. Um, <laughs> and speaking of shout outs, well, okay, before we go into shout outs, Theta, one more time. Stress Positions opens when? Stress Positions opens in New York, April 19th at IFC, and then it will open in LA and other markets on uh, April 26th. From Neon. From, from neon. neon. From Neon. And go see La Chimera. And go see La Chimera. <laughs> Put more money in the pot. Go see Immaculate. Immaculate. Yeah. Uh, uh, just show up for Sydney because she has a huge hit movie right now and she would really appreciate it yeah. if you could show up for her. In show this up time for her. Need. And and while you're at the theater, why not go see Stress, Stress Position? Position? Do Stress a double Starring feature. John Early, Amy Zimmer, me, the wonderful Kaher Harhash, um, uh, and um, many others. John Roberts. Mm -hmm. Wow. Do you think, um, you know, in a sort of, if Neon were to do a multiverse, <laughs> yeah. would you um, potentially... What if your character, and again, I have not seen the film, maybe <laughs> represented Sandra Huller for her next murder trial? I think it would be beautiful. They do have contractual. <laughs> they or No, 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 they don't. I actually have sequel rights for this oh, movie. There will okay. never be a sequel to this movie. Well, but, but maybe. I do have could, sequel rights. They really Maybe Immaculate. You know, Sydney Sweeney can move into the house. Sydney Sweeney could move into the house. Sandra Huller. Everybody Sandra should get together. <laughs> <laughs> we like that show Drawn Together. Oh my God. I yes. Love it. Drawn classic. Together, but it's all neon properties. So, <laughs> well, I'm right. smelling dollars already. <laughs> <laughs> George, will you describe our final segment? I would be honored and delighted to. Our final segment, Theta, is called Shoutouts. And in this segment, we pay homage to the grand straight tradition of the radio shoutout. And what better place to do that than literally overlooking Times Square? We are flanked by billboards, flashing billboards on all sides. I can only imagine they're all advertising the U.S. military. And so, you know, <laughs> you sort of, you're shouting out to your friends back home. You're on Z100. You're yeah. in TRL. I think... I can go first. Yeah, I also actually had came up with one when you were talking. Oh, do you want to go first? Actually, yeah, that could be amazing. Go on. Okay, what is up, freaks, losers, and needless to say, perverts around the globe? I want to give a gigantic shout out to having a lunch dessert. I do not like sweets. I, I I have never said I like sweets. And recently, you know, life is suffering and I eat lunch and I say, if I have a little cookie after this, I will feel like I'm having a great day. So I have become one of these people that gets a little cookie after lunch and it makes me feel like a child. It, I'm filled with childlike wonder. It makes me feel normal in sort of, we're talking about joining the masses way. I feel like I'm one of the masses. So it makes me feel like, you know what? Why are you spending your whole life fighting? Maybe Maybe just relax for a bit and go with the damn flow. Not everything is a battle. Have a cookie after lunch and, and live your damn life. I'm eating sweets now. Woo! Wow. Shout out to sweets. Shout out to sweets. I love it. At lunch. At too. lunch. It, it changes everything. Yeah. All right. 
<clears throat> What's up, adventurers? I want to give a shout out to, you'll never believe this, doing a polar plunge in the ocean. <laughs> Now, currently in April, when it's still cold out, I am so not the type of person who would ever do anything like this. Any, I am so to me an activity like that. I say I look at people doing it and I say, "Oh, you don't have an, a, enough excitement in your own life. You're in a uh, loveless marriage. You're having an affair with your assistant, and you don't even like her. <laughs> you are absolutely, you know, you, you have nothing to live for, and so you're looking for places to feel alive." I was so wrong. This is one of the most amazing things I've ever done in my life. I did it for my friend Lindsay's birthday in the Rockaways. I have never felt more in community with people. We all ran into the cold water together. I was so in the moment that I swear to God, I lost my glasses in the ocean. I repeat, I lost this my glasses. Where they went. That's where That's they are. Where they went. That's why I have these backup ones now. And oh, I have to say, when I look back on it, I don't feel a sense of loss. I feel a sense of liberation. <laughs> I am Aphrodite coming out of that shell. I am, you know, uh, Splash, the mermaid from Splash coming out and gaining legs. I loved being in the cold water. I love feeling invigorated and alive with just a group of sort of gay men and women <laughs> <laughs> and New York based freelance creators, you know, the people yeah. that make up my community. <laughs> so, yeah, you guys, home. you have like a matter of days left, honestly, by the time this episode comes out, go to the beach, do a polar plunge, and maybe leave your glasses in the <laughs> okay, you're bad. That's a beautiful <laughs> shout out. I, I, I'm gonna literally. We are in Times Square. Mm -hmm. It's not. I'm not gonna shout out an abstraction. I'm gonna literally shout out. Yesterday, I was in Times Square in peak hours, having a full panic attack, like on the street, and I and there was nowhere to turn. I walked into a reflexology fifty-five dollar massage place, oh. and I got the most um, ex, ex, amazing massage from a wonderful, nice woman. No, nothing untoward. Okay. <laughs> And she's right around the corner wow. here at Times Square. So I want to give a shout out, not just to that woman, but also to the idea of treating herself to a massage, wow. a walk-in massage. You can do it, especially and it's only falling $35? apart. Well, there was tip and stuff, and oh, they try to get but, you to do still, add another still. 30 minutes, but whatever. You I just mean, say no and didn't. I've only gotten a massage once in my life, and... It was more than fifty five dollars. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a that's deal. why you'll get a Cobble Hill. I've never, I've never done it. Um, I walk in. I also really appreciate you saying that nothing untoward happened because as soon as someone says they got a massage, I'm like, okay, but be honest. Like, I know exactly. <laughs> no, nothing happened. A face down the whole time, just you know, the pressing, then the rubbing, yeah. then the hot stone or whatever, and then a big thwack. You know how they thwack? Ooh, yeah. you got a thwack. thwack. So you really bottom. got it all for fifty five. Got it all for fifty five. Wow. Wow. The variety pack. Um, we'll see you at the Times Square Reflexology. That's, I hope everything is all right with the establishment and that, that it's not a totally yeah. evil, dark, sinister place. But they really saved my ass yesterday. Wow. That's a genuine shout I out. I love that. Well, Theta, Theta thank you so been... much for doing the podcast. This has been a real treat. Both. It's so nice of you to have me on. I really appreciate it. We love you and we can't wait to see the movie and everyone go see Stress Positions. And I should say, we haven't even said the word Nympho Wars. Listen to Nympho Wars, um, Theta's podcast with past also two-timer Macy Rodman. It's a two, we have two two-timers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two two timers Every in one week. podcast <laughs> every wednesday uh, <laughs> wow and you know if i can for a second i want to give a special shout out to the recent two-part episode about the storytelling convention oh, that, <laughs> I really, that really got me oh that's nice really that's got nice. me and it, it harkened harkened back to the two-part drag race oh of course so iconic we'll never live it down we'll yeah. never we'll never we'll never get yeah. there Oops. <laughs> okay <laughs> all right bye guys okay bye, bye. Yeah,